welcome everyone. My name is Stacy Blakely and I'm the executive director of the Policy Circle. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to participate in our Move the Needle program. The Policy Circle's mission is to inform and equip women to be more impactful local civic leaders. We do this in a number of ways, and uh, one of those the primary ways is through our Policy Circle briefs. We have recently published a brief on literacy, and today's Move the Needle, I think, is going to be illuminating, challenging, and maybe surprising for many of you. Things that we've learned while working on this brief include the fact that 54% of American adults read below the equivalent of a sixth grade level. It's nearly one in five adults read at or below a third grade level. So what does that mean? Lower literacy rates directly correlate to higher unemployment, reduced income, and overall impacts the U.S.'s ability to be globally competitive. We're going to unpack several of these issues today, but I think it's also important to think about our students. 60% of U.S. public and non-public school students were below grade level in reading at the last report that was done in 19, 2019. And understanding both K through 12 literacy rates as well as adult literacy rates at this local level is critical to overall improving the policies and driving access to improve literacy. This matters for so many reasons, and I'm excited to welcome our first guest today. Ann Wicks is the Ann Kimball Johnson Director of Education and Opportunity at the George W. Bush Institute. In this role, she develops and oversees the policy, research, and engagement work of the education and economic growth teams. Over her career, she's held roles at Teach for America, the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health, and Stanford University. Anne, thank you so much for spending time with us today. I am eager to jump in. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. And this is, uh, Stacey, this is one of my favorite topics. And I'm delighted to be able to talk about this with, um, you've got some great folks coming on this panel, some great experts. So I hope that's useful to all your members and listeners. I know it's going to be eye-opening because I can tell you when we started working on this brief, as we started digging into the data, I was surprised, and, and it won't surprise you, but we were surprised more people aren't talking about this yes. enormous challenge. So that, that report I referenced earlier is that National Assessment of Education Progress. Yes. So I guess 19 is the latest data we have on that. And it even showed then, you know, 40% of these students in that public and non-public schools were reading at or above grade level. And then it showed less than 30% of students in like these large urban settings were yeah. struggling. Yeah. And so the impact of COVID, we know this is monumental. And so what can we expect as we probably start to uncover more data points around this in terms of the progress of literacy in this country? Oh, well, it's when you think about that number you gave, sometimes it's easy to get lost in those statistics. And and we call that NAEP, the National Assessment for Education Progress, the wonk shorthand, NAEP. Okay. We love it. The Good nerds in policy love that because it's a great apples to apples test of kids around the country. So that's a, one of the best ways we have to sample and look at what's actually happening for young people around this country, whether they're in Reno, Nevada, they're in Cincinnati, they're in a little town in East Texas, they're in Maine. You know, what, what is what's really happening for kids? What's alarming is we see this really consistent thread. Right. We don't. So many kids are not reading what that really looks like. That's millions of kids. We're not mm -hmm. talking about a handful. That's millions of kids who might be reading, but not where we'd expect them um, really struggling. And so what happens for those of you who know and love kids, you have kids in your life that you know and love. If they've struggled at something in school, you know how quickly that can become a spiral. Right. Mm -hmm. Where they they think, oh, gosh, I'm not smart. I'm not, school's not for me, I can't do this, I can't do that. When actually, they just haven't been given the tools to read well and understand their own God-given abilities and intelligence and strengths. And so when we think about the importance of reading and literacy for kids, this is about making sure young people around our country understand themselves, their world, they have a belief in their own brains and ability to learn, which every child can learn. And so that's why this is so critical. Reading is not just a discrete skill. It allows kids to access knowledge across every subject that they need, whether it's science or social studies or any medicine, anything they can imagine and do anchors in reading. 
And so what are we doing as a country? And then maybe you can help us understand better. How can we overcome what we're seeing as a big literacy gap? Yes, 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 yes. So the best thing we can do is make sure that our our talented educators and principals know how to teach reading. That, that seems like a silly thing to have to double check, but without getting too deep in the weeds on this, there's been a debate, you may have heard the reading wars or a debate about how reading should have been taught that's gone on for some time. I know when I, uh, that President and Mrs. Bush worked on this when they were in the governor's mansion in Austin. Like this has been around for a while. How do you make sure that teachers and principals understand the best research-based way to teach reading? There's a significant shift happening in the country that we think is a good one, uh, that there is a recognition of a science of reading or the science of teaching reading that relies on cognitive science, neuroscience, uh, disciplines, a cross-disciplinary study of how kids' brains work and how they take in information that anchors in really explicit systemic instruction. Some people might know that, like, oh, we got to teach them phonics. Well, phonics is one element of it. It's phonics, which is the sound, it's phonemic awareness, which is the sound. Phonics is how the sounds and the letters connect. It gets into fluency, vocabulary, comprehension. These are all kind of woven together, but it's anchored in really systematic and explicit instruction. And far too many of our country's educators, really talented people who believe in their kids and want to do right by their kids, haven't actually been taught the right way to teach reading in this research-based way. You're starting to see that change. State policy across the country, there's, I think now about 30 states that have passed something that is sort of forcing the issue. Um, And you'll see it happen district by district. I was part of, kind of by happenstance, the school district where my son attends school happens to be something called a balanced literacy district. That is the wrong approach. We don't want people using a balanced literacy approach. Mm -hmm. And we had a group of moms who worked together. We just were a group of moms. I happen to work on this issue professionally, but they're just moms yeah. who noticed an issue. And we really work together to do research, show policy, get examples, get experts, and have helped support our district in making a pretty significant shift to move to the science of reading. So I really recommend for people on this call who are thinking about it, you don't have to rely on your state house. They can really help you. But actually parents, this is a way for parents to really engage meaningfully by paying attention to what's actually happening in their, in their schools, in their school district. And you know what? It's interesting because I now have a a freshman or a sophomore in college and she is part of that generation, unfortunately, that was caught up in in a time when they stopped teaching phonics and phonetic reading. And uh, and to this day, let's just say she has very special pronunciation of certain (laughs) But but what I think this stems from, right, is we have a fairly large group of students that were part of an experiment that probably didn't work. And Uh now we see some, you know, like you mentioned, I mean, kind of the reading wars. It's kind of shocking to me that we're still having debates about this because proof is in the pudding, right, in the data. Um, But tell me, what do you think are some of those barriers? Because I think parents need to understand that they can, they, you know, they may have best intentions to come in and start asking questions, but they need to be prepared for the fact that there are some pretty strong camps, if you will, and opinions on this topic. So can you give us a better sense of sort of maybe why that is, what those barriers are to us just getting back to proven practices? Yes. No, it's such a good question because civic, civil, civic and civil discourse requires a baseline of respect, right? You don't want to come in and tell people they're idiots, right? Right. That's, that's an ineffective strategy. (laughs) We we try to avoid that. (laughs) The good news is there's a ton of resources out there now. I would, if a parent is concerned about this, if you're thinking about it, you can get smart pretty quickly based on some great media coverage of this issue. Emily Hanford is one of the best reporters on this. I'll say her her last name again, Hanford, H-A-N-F-O-R-D. She's a reporter who several years ago started to break what was happening around the balanced literacy approach and how problematic it was and how much kids were suffering by on campuses that were using this approach. It works for some kids, but it leaves a ton of kids behind and every child misses out on that explicit instruction, the things you were talking about that you see in your daughter now. So spend a little time reading up on this issue and getting smart. There's some really great resources out there that are pretty close at hand to help get familiar and some questions you can start to ask in your district. What is your literacy framework? How are you teaching reading? And expect some pushback because if 
teachers are not, or principals are not trying to uh, be naysayers, but they themselves have not been exposed to this most likely. They are just starting to get better training and exposure to this piece of research. It's uncovering a big gap in the field around how we prepare and support principals and teachers. I think that's a really interesting issue in this because it's not their fault. Like these are not, these are people who are deeply invested in children and want them to be successful. Right. Mm -hmm. But they have been trained in one way. And now everyone's saying, guess what? That is ineffective. And we have decades of research to show it and it's helping them sort of know enough to be able to make a change. That's hard for any professional, right? But Absolutely. we should expect that in education and medicine. We expect our doctors to stay up on the latest research to change practice as research dictates and outcome data it dictates. We should expect that same thing in education. But the good news is there's lots of resources about this right now. Um, anybody can reach, if a parent is thinking about, it, I'm happy to talk about what we did in our little district. It was not part of my official job, but it was certainly beneficial to have the background I do around this issue. And no, a group of parents, we were able to, you know, sort of work together to find a way to make change. Well, and I think that that's very much part of our DNA at the policy circle, right? Let's get equipped. Let's understand the issues. Let's build coalitions. And I mean, I think one of the things I'd love to ask you about, and this is kind of off script, so so don't don't shoot me in. No, but no. I'm kind of curious about when you look at sort of the groups that are left behind, we can look at these overall numbers, but kids that have learning differences and and the programs that have been designed for that and whether or not those have been effectively implemented. Obviously, you've got some school districts that have more resources right? So they've got probably some more things there. But what do we do if that's a population we're particularly concerned about and we're very concerned about them getting falling behind? Oh, yes. I mean, I think this is a place where you're going to see you're going to see that a big the group of moms I was just talking about. They got together because many of them had children with dyslexia or other reading issues. Mm -hmm. They will be particularly very poorly served by a balanced literacy or whole language approach. So that's how they found each other initially is they were like, how do we help our kids? Mm -hmm. It's really important for anybody in this is that we're using explicit systemic instruction. If you if your child is dyslexic or had a, has a reading issue, they, there are very concrete supports that we can give to children so that they learn to read. Those kids, that's not about being smart. That's not about not being able to learn. They absolutely can learn. They're just going to need a different kind of explicit support to get there. There are the interventions. If you're seeing an intervention in your district that doesn't seem like it's really explicit and builds upon itself and you as a parent have an understanding of how your child should progress through that, that's a red flag. You should ask questions to be sure um, you're understanding what that what that looks like. And and if you're still not satisfied to, to continue to seek resources around that, it's a big deal because we don't want a child with a reading difference or a learning difference is still a gifted child. There's many, there's many children actually who qualify as, as gifted plus with a learning difference. Those are not, those are not opposite ends of a spectrum. They're That's often right. aligned. Yeah. And I think it's really, really important that we just the uh, that we understand that educators start to have a better understanding of okay, this is actually how children's brains learn, whether it's reading, it is scaffolded, is it's explicit. We don't just sort of put kids in a corner and hope by osmosis by that they'll sort of figure it out. That's It requires more from us as adults. So, and from a sort of a policy level, we've talked about what parents can do. Can you just give me a quick sort of snapshot into maybe things you're working on or that you're familiar with kind of at that policy level? You mentioned 30 states had passed some legislation yeah. to get us back on track. Can you give us a, a, a sense of what's going on in that area and maybe ways we can get involved on the policy side? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you two of my favorite examples. Okay. Uh, in, in Massachusetts, they have started giving grants to schools to get rid of low quality balanced literacy literacy curriculum resources and buy higher quality uh, materials. This is important because this stuff is expensive mm. and districts may want to make a change, but not have the resources to do it. And this is a really strong policy carrot to get school districts to buy high quality, the right kind of thing. So that is one example. Some states have come at it that way. Um, see, in our, our state of Texas, you and I are both in, sitting in here in Texas. One of the things that Texas did in a big education bill passed a couple of years ago was to uh, uh, ensure that every K-3 teacher and principal in our state is trained in the science of teaching reading through a very specific program. So every teacher in this state is going to be trained on what this should look like. Mm. Um, and every principal, so the principals know this is what should be happening in my teacher's classrooms. And if you go through that program and really understand it, 
it becomes very hard to defend a balanced literacy framework or approach in your district. And so the, that's a knowledge is power approach, right? Like let's give Absolutely. the educators the training and support they need to serve children well, which is why they're in the jobs. Absolutely. And I think that's a great example. And I think in our follow-up email for anyone that's participating today, that's interested in sort of that model legislation, or they're interested in digging in on the policy issues, we can provide some additional resources. But Anne, this is really helpful. I so appreciate your insight. We're going to bring you back in a few minutes, but right now we want to shift gears and talk about adult literacy. And uh, I want to introduce somebody that I have a great deal of respect for, and um, we're delighted she's joined us today. British Robinson is the president and CEO of the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. She was selected through a national search in 2018 after the passing of its founder, former First Lady Barbara Bush. Welcome, British. We are so excited to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, Stacey. It's a pleasure to be here and congratulations to you and the team on the report. Oh, thank you so much. Well, we appreciate your insight and input uh, to make sure that this literacy brief really was covering all the facets because this is a complex issue. It's not nearly as straightforward as just talking about K through 12 and kids being able to read well. I think some of these statistics that really shocked us and that I want to discuss with you is about adult you know, literacy rates. And so one of those stats we shared in the beginning was 54% of adults, that's ages 16 to 74 years old. I think that translates to about 130 million people lack proficiency uh, in literacy. Can you help us understand exactly what that means and perhaps how that impacts quality of life? Sure. Let me, let me sort of break that down a, a little bit. So generally speaking, Literacy, simply put, is the ability to read, write, and comprehend. When we talk about 54% of American adults lack proficiency in literacy, that essentially means that they read below, equivalent to reading below a sixth grade level. That means that you can't be a full worker, parent, or citizen in society. It's an issue of equity. Um, it's an issue that affects our economy, that affects public health, et cetera. Simply put, it means maybe you can't read a medicine bottle. Uh, you can't put your child on Zoom. You may not be able to read a ballot. So that means you can't vote. You might not be able to read a bus sign or a subway sign. So you would be directionally challenged in your own city or town. The numbers and the impact that low literacy in America have on us today are significant. We know that about 53% of adults around 25 or over who are not, who haven't graduated from high school, they're not participating in the workforce, for example. We know that 80% of jobs by 2024, you're gonna have to, are gonna require a high school diploma. It also affects the bottom line for our federal, state, and local governments related to revenue and tax base. Um, for us at the Barbara Bush Foundation, we also saw it as this deep economic argument. It affects our security, it affects our ability to really compete with others around the world. Um, in particular, we did a study in 2019, we commissioned it with Gallup, and we found that if we could lift everybody up, that 54% of the population, to a sixth grade level, that we would generate an additional $2.2 trillion back into our economy. Um, what this translates to is actual take home money, is, is your salary or your checks. The annual income for adults at a sixth grade level is about $63,000 a year. That means you can actually take care of your family and live a, a decent life. If you're at about a third to a fifth grade level, your take home income is about $48,000 a year. And if you're third grade or below, you're around $34,000 a year. For most of us to remind us that at $34,000 a year, that's poverty level. That's so we have millions of people, millions of families, not just parents, but those children that Anne was talking about um, they're not able to fully participate in the workforce, which means they're struggling to lift their families out of poverty. And it's a constant cycle around poverty, but also low literacy. For example, oh, oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. We're, we're coming out of COVID or wherever we are with COVID. And I think it's important to remind ourselves that, you know, there was a study that was done that we now know the the, the impact of COVID, many millions of people could not understand basic COVID protocols, washing your hands, putting on a mask, et cetera. 
And so that really affects our bottom line again. Again, ultimately, it's an issue of equity. Typically, you're going to be in low income housing, poorly educated, um, and then you're also suffer from food insecurity as well. And so for us at the Barbara Bush Foundation, we want to make sure that this issue is on the hearts and minds of every American and on the hearts and minds of the American people. Well, and you just touched on something that I'm, I'd love for you to unpack a little bit more. And as we talk about this, you know, this statistic, right, we do tend to get lost in the statistics. Give us a sense of sort of who these folks are and maybe why they're in this position, right? I think that's always a question, Mark, for everyone is, you know, how does an adult get to this stage or phase of life and, and, and why are they in this position? And, you know, maybe what are the factors that have led up to that? Right. So there are many reasons why there is, first and foremost, there is not one reason. Um, I think we always want the simple answer um, that it was your fault or you dropped out of school. There are numerous reasons from either the education system that, that Ann was talking about, you know, lack of evidence based reading programs, all the way to your parents may have passed away in a, in a car crash and you were, were a foster child and you moved from home to home to families where the parent has had cancer. There are numerous reasons. I think the biggest caution we have is that make sure that there's a lot of stigma around low literacy and we wanna break that cycle of stigma as well. So first and foremost, there are, lo there are lots of reasons how you end up here. Also, when you get to 30 or 40 or 50 years old, you're not gonna run around and raise your hand and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm low literate, I need help. So we need to figure out a way, and we feel like we've done that here at the foundation, is how do we meet people where, where they are? How do we reduce that, that stigma as well? So that's what we're, we're working on around some tools, which I'm happy to mention in a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think you bring up another point there that I think is really interesting and, and how the, the Barbara Bush Foundation does promote sort of family literacy. And I think this is such an important concept as we think about the impact. Um, but talk to us about what makes that approach unique or how that's a more holistic approach that you all, uh, you know, have, have implemented with success. Right. You know, let me tie a little bit back to, to Anne's point. Um, you know, a child doesn't typically live alone. Uh, Barbara Bush, our, our founder, always said that a parent is the child's first and best teacher. And that's exactly right. So while we want to make sure that programming in our schools, exactly what Ann said, are evidence-based, et cetera, we also want to empower that parent. We want to lift up that parent so that they have the skills that they need um, to assist their children. Um, so the parent and child are inextricably linked, that this is connected to both. It's not one or the other. We also want to caution that we don't pit sort of the needs of an adult learner against the needs of a child learner. They're all critical, um, and we want to look at it in a holistic, a holistic fashion. So that parent, or in particular, there was a, 19, a late 1990 study done by NIH that actually showed that a mother's education attainment is the single greatest factor in her child's future academic success. So that is our point of view. That was the vision of our founder. She was right 33 years ago, and she's still right today. And so if we make sure that that parent or that mother has their um, diploma or they've reached a certain level of education, that child that Ann was talking about is going to be a lot more successful in school if we can equip them to then support the, the policies, the structure, um, the, and the approach of the school system. Okay, that is a staggering, I think, sort of statistic or, or when you talk about that single greatest factor, I mean, that's pretty incredible for us to think about. And it, it does force us to think there's this whole continuum that has these generational effects, right, British? I mean, there's so much to this. Talk to me a little bit about some of the other tools that, that your foundation has found to be um, really effective as, as we obviously dealing with stigma, I think is a huge issue. And I'm glad you brought that up, but also just sort of concrete practices you're finding, uh, you know, are showing uh, improvement for these adults. Absolutely. So as we think about breaking that multi-generational cycle of low literacy, looking at it in a holistic way, um, and in particular, breaking the, the issue around stigma is that we're bullish on technology. Um, technology or ed tech has been very successful in the, in the early childhood uh, grade school space, but it actually hasn't really been dealt with in the, on the adult literacy space. Um, there are less than 2 million Americans who are currently served by traditional place-based adult basic education programs. 
we've got, I said earlier, we have to meet people where they are. That means if you're on the bus, if you're commuting from two or three jobs um, late at night, once you put your kids down to bed. So Barbara Bush, before she passed away, said, I think technology can be a game changer. And that meant that we have the opportunity to teach people how to learn, uh, to catch them up, if you will, or give them the capacity to, to move up um, in, their, in their particular job so they can be full parents, workers, and citizens. And that means we have to meet them anytime, anywhere. So for us, we are heavily invested in ed tech for adults. We're looking at gaming. In fact, we're partnered with Southern Methodist University around a major gaming um, app um, that we're pretty bullish on. It's had some success and is still in a pilot phase. We're looking at AI um, and we're also looking at virtual reality. So again, meeting people, I like to say, where they live, play, pray, and work. So what are all those community-based organizations and platforms where we can actually help get to the parent? And that means sometimes we also do that through reading mentorship programs. So going again back to where Ann started, we may reach the parent, we may reach the parent through the child. So we have after school or school based or out of school based reading mentorship programs. In fact, this year we're celebrating our 20th anniversary of a program formerly known as Teen Trendsetters. Um, it's now called Read Squad. And it's an evidence based, exactly what Ann said, an evidence based, high quality curriculum program. Um, we were recognized by the Library of Congress just this past year where our current evaluation shows that after school, this mentorship program is able to move kids who are typically a grade or more behind in grade level reading, typically in their grades, they're in grades one, two, and three, up to three times higher than kids who didn't participate in our program. Wow. And then second, we have an out of school program that could be done on any platform, community centers, libraries, parks and recs, YMCA, you name it, that's online mentorship program called Book Explorers. And that's more of a 12 week kind of intensive program uh, mentorship program to catch kids up. And then our third and last kind of intervention of how we're solving the problem is really related to research and thought leadership. I told you about the Gallup study a few minutes ago. If you don't know the problem, you can't see the problem, you can't fix the problem. So we wanted to tie the problem to our economic situation so that more Americans would care about it. We also wanted to show you where the problem is. It's mostly in the South and in the East. It affects our urban and our rural areas. It's black, white, and brown. It's an equal opportunity issue. Um, so we need to care about it for everybody. Um, so we do that. We have on our, if you go to our website, we have a gap map. So it'll tell you exactly all the way down in your state, down to the county level, what the literacy rates look like so that you can actually take action. And then lastly, we like to raise awareness um, around broader issues. When we just launched a national action plan uh, with First Lady uh, Dr. Joe Biden um, last fall, where we brought the entire literacy field together to try to solve this problem, or at least make a dent in it, over the next five years. It's a collective impact initiative where we're gonna look at research, technology, professional development, and education and awareness. So those are our three best bets, um, and we hope that more folks will join us, but also more importantly, really see the link between what Anne was talking about. It's parent and child, child and parent. It's not one or the other. I think that's so important and, and that I really appreciate you sort of tying all of this together, British. And I have really liked to hear about the innovation that you're embracing uh, it, with technology and, and, and sort of emerging um, opportunities to reach more people in more places. And so that works a perfect transition uh, for our next speaker. So we will be back to you in just a few minutes, British. Uh, excited now to have Danny Headland. She's the founder of Brink Literacy Project. She founded Brink Literacy at 19 years old. Uh, she wanted to champion new and diverse stories. In addition to leading Brink as CEO, she's the editor in chief of Brink's critically acclaimed publication, Friction, uh, one of the fastest growing literary magazines in the world. Danny, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks so much for having me, and thanks for bringing me among such esteemed colleagues. It was amazing. I was taking fervent notes on everything they said. Well, you know what? I think that is so interesting. Uh, you and I had a chance to, to meet a few months ago, and the minute I heard about what you were doing, I thought, this is the type of a sort of innovation and creativity um, that really the policy circle loves to highlight. So Brink Literacy works to drive literacy rates through this innovation and creativity to really reach new audiences. Can you tell me a little bit more about your sort of storytelling model, why it's been successful and why you're so unique? 
Yeah, of course. Um, well, I really um, resonated with what Anne was talking about because I was one of the people that went through the balanced literacy approach. Um, I also have a very high level of dyslexia that wasn't diagnosed until I was at university at Oxford. So I spent all of my younger education in special ed being told that I was stupid and being told that was kind of the only way I could engage. So I kept falling further and further behind. And one of the things that I really realized to engage with literacy as a student when kind of the system was failing was that the biggest thing that I needed was just to love what I was doing enough to push through that, particularly anyone who struggles with dyslexia. It's not just an inability to read in a traditional way. It creates physical um, symptoms. So I had terrible headaches. I just kind of became disenchanted. I started to really believe what people told me that was that I was stupid. And very luckily for me, my father stubbornly was like, no, my daughter's not stupid. She's just weird and bought me a copious amount of X-Men comics. And comics do a really fascinating thing for people that struggle with literacy. They, first of all, use the visual element to make sure you're still engaging with the story. You're still excited about the plot and the characters. And that sort of passion will push you through the reading. But there's very simple things like the text isn't justified, which makes it much easier for people with a learning difference to be able to identify the individual letters. So when I finally fell in love with reading enough that I could push through these sort of barriers, I realized there were so many other people that were probably struggling in similar ways, not just with not engaging with the education that they need to exceed and to get out of terrible circumstances, but also with the stories that other people are telling them about who they are. So when Brink Literacy started, we wanted to create a two-fold sort of system. We wanted to make sure that we were helping people get the education skills they needed, but we also wanted to use that storytelling element to change the stories they told about themselves so they could have that compass to push forward, so they could actually want to engage with education and with a different sort of life. So I think that the model it, it really speaks to me having a child that has challenges with reading because there is that fatigue and the struggle, right? And so pushing through some of those frustration barriers. Tell us a little more about uh, the actual sort of products uh, and and the work that, that, that Brink Literacy is doing so that it is more interesting and engaging. Yeah, um, well, I love this question. Essentially, just like British says, what we're trying to do is we're trying to meet people where they actually are. So I love that they're exploring gaming and all these different elements. For us, we're really product driven. So I go out there and I figure out like, what are people actually excited about? And how can I trick them into reading as a part of that excitement? So there are certainly simpler things we do. We have an in-house publisher, we put out friction, we do a bunch of comics, and those are not just a bunch of old dead straight white guys writing. Like we go into an educational classroom with stories from people just like them. And I think that's really essential to build empathy and interest. But we also do really insane things. Like last year, we put out a literary tarot deck because people were really into tarot decks. And I knew literally nothing about that aside from the fact that young people were buying it. So we brought in all these amazing celebrity authors like Margaret Atwood came in, Stephen Fry came in, Roxane Gay, and they took an individual tarot card and they paired it with a piece of classic literature. And on the front, that just seems incredibly silly. But what it actually did was to get people to be like, oh, I care about this one thing. I don't know a lot about Dickens. I don't know a lot about Shakespeare, but now I have a gateway interest. I'm gonna go read those books. I'm gonna create a reading group around that. So we saw this huge spike of people engaging with the classics, which was much more effective than me going into a classroom and throwing Shakespeare on the table and saying, all right, guys, we're gonna read this till our eyes bleed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think that that is a, is a great approach because like you're saying, you're, you're sparking something that's kind of already there and giving and packaging it in a new way, which I think is super interesting. So, you know, one of the things you just kind of mentioned about being um, preparing these materials in a way that, that, that the readers can relate. You also have a focus on driving literacy rates and programs for marginalized communities. What's your approach to that? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, Particularly, I like to think about this on the prison model. Although we work in a lot of marginalized communities, prisons are kind of the perfect incubator for us to figure out whether or not our teaching is working. Because obviously society has a ladder and we try to catch people on every other rung. It's 
through the education system, through child services, through health services. And if we failed everything else, they end up in prison. So this is kind of where we figure out that people are most disenfranchised with the system. They really dislike educators. They don't want to engage. So if we can kind of connect with adults at this level, we can package that and take it almost anywhere else. It's, it's really the forge for how we think about education. So when we're thinking of developing curriculum, for many people that came through things like the balanced literacy approach, so they already feel left behind and overlooked and misunderstood. And then they have a bunch of disenfranchisement and they don't want to engage. What we try to do there is make sure that all of the materials are about them. Because again, it's not just about teaching them the education skills they need to get out of prison and stay out of prison. It's changing the way they think about themselves so they even want to go and do that. So for example, in prisons, I teach a ludicrous amount of Batman comics. I just come in with my arm brimming with the Joker and it allows us to access people with lower education rates because it's comics. And as we talked about, very easy tool for reluctant readers and low income readers, I'm sorry, low literacy readers. But it also brings up really vital questions. Like we read Batman and we think, okay, the Joker was once a struggling comedian and then he had one bad day and now he's a super villain. Does that like relate to anything we're experiencing as people? And we open really big dialogues about that because literacy isn't just how to read and write. Literacy is how we create empathy. It's how we relate to each other and with ourselves. It's how we build internal narratives that act as a compass going forward. So a lot of what we teach isn't just let's go through products, let's go through reading. It's let's have big discussions about storytelling so we can internalize that and then want to move forward. So every single course, they write a graphic memoir, like they write their own comic about a moment in their lives that was really critical to who they were. And that empowers them about their decisions. And they really focus on telling their own stories and kind of don't notice that they're learning literacy skills on the back end. Since, as you heard from the tarot ramble, almost everything we try to do is kind of tricking people into learning without them knowing. Well, the stealth approach, I think, is is really interesting. And, and you've seen a lot of success with this. And something you were just mentioning, is, is that really that concept of functional literacy and to societal literacy? Because that was something I know that that's a big emphasis for Brink literacy. Can, can you unpack that a little bit for us, like the, yeah. the difference or how those concepts go together? As I'm sure everyone who knows who read your beautiful brief, there's a lot of language changes around how we define literacy, and it changes every decade. The reason that we have a really strong focus on the difference between general literacy, or sometimes called societal literacy, and functional literacy is that when you look at prison rates, they're really horrifying. Like, Stacey, you talked about the 54%. It's over 75 in prisons and it's 45% are functionally illiterate. And that leads people to think the people who end up in prison are stupid. But just as the speakers before me said, the actual ability to read and write and intelligence are not linked. So when we talk about functional literacy versus general literacy, so I'm talking about the ability to integrate into your community, ability to know just enough um, reading and writing skills to actually function and navigate, are often different. So someone who really struggles to actually take an exam about reading and writing, it's not a reflection of their intelligence, it's a reflection of their education. So we draw a really big distinction there, mostly to deal with the negative stigma around people who end up in these marginalized communities. So that's kind of how we draw that. And we also use it as a way to relate to our students. So for example, It's very common that I can sit down with one of my incarcerated students, even if they dropped out of school in the third grade, and have an incredibly articulate conversation about the kind of food their moms used to make, or like what their kids are doing, or what was the big drama in the food court that day. Clearly, all my examples are food or mother related. But they have the ability to understand and empathize with narrative. They just don't have the ability to translate that into reading and writing. So that's the angle that we always take as educators. Can we get them to talk about story? Can we use that as a safe space for them to start reading and writing about it? And that's kind of the distinction that's particularly important in prisons, just so we get past that stigmatism. Well, Danny, I love your approach. I think it is so thoughtful. And again, with, I love the creativity and innovation. And uh, i just excited to share your work with our audience. 
Um, and so I really appreciate you taking the time to come on today and share your perspective with us. Um, and, and I'm eager for everyone to kind of dive in and, and learn more ways that they can get involved with you. But first, I'd love to bring everyone back. Um, if we've got uh, um, all our team, great. OK, everyone is back. So this is kind of an opportunity for us to do two things. We're going to have a quick lightning round because we always like anyone that either reads a policy circle brief or participates in a move the needle, not only to come away, OK, I'm more informed. What am I going to do about it? And so I'm going to start with you, Anne, if that's OK, and just say, what would you say the viewers today? What's the steps they can take? to help drive access and increased opportunity for literacy in their own community? Well, I will say, first of all, I mean, I love listening to Danny and British. I mean, they're, I think really understanding sort of from an empathetic and deep way, what the ability to read provides every, everybody in our community, every neighbor, every person, everybody that you see, it is, it creates access to opportunity and agency. So I think step one is just, Honestly, think like think about all the ways that reading touches your life and what we want everybody who lives in community with us to be able to do. Right. And I think um, that is that is step number one. It's e it's one of those things that's easy if, if reading is just like you don't even think about it because you do it so much to actually think about how your life is different. If you don't have that ability to understand other people and make yourself understood, I think that is so critical. Uh, the second piece I would recommend as I really think about this is to know how are, how is your community, how's your school teaching reading to kids and how are they supporting it and what, where can you engage in your community to support strong reading practice in your schools and strong reading practices for families, whether that's through your town library, there's all sorts of, there's great programs and British would know a ton about this, but I think know what that looks like in your community. And even if you think, oh gosh, I think I live somewhere where most people can probably read and I, like, I think really get curious about that to understand what's being provided um, in your community and figure out how you can support it either with your, your time or treasure, I think is really important. I love that. And that's such a, a big part of our DNA is get curious, ask questions. So I think that's a perfect way uh, for, for everyone to kind of come away from, from this discussion. British, what are your thoughts on what the viewers and participants in today's program can do to really help move the needle on this issue? Yeah, let me, let me just pick up on a, a higher level point that I think is a through line from today that all learners, and in our case, adult learners, are some of the smartest people around. Um, and let's recognize that. They just need a little help from us to help break down some of those barriers um, so they can live their lives with dignity um, and they can reach their full potential. Um, so that's one, just a, a, a reminder. Um, the, the first thing tactically to pick up on Anne's point is, you know, we all don't realize it, but we actually know people in our lives or in our circles or in our networks that may be low literate. Um, and the first thing you can do is you can go to the National Literacy Directory. It's www.nld.org. And on that directory, it will tell you every service literacy council, literacy programs in your city, in your state. Um, and then you could volunteer. You can learn more about the issue. You can volunteer. Um, you can check out the local literacy services, that sort of thing. Um, so you, you can engage and you can do something about it. But also, if you know somebody that needs help, try to direct them towards those services that you'll find on the National Literacy Directory. And then lastly, the field of literacy in particular family literacy and adult literacy is under-researched and underfunded. We actually don't know enough about the adult learner and there's simply not very, there's very little money in this field. The single largest donor um, in this work is the Dollar General Literacy Foundation. Um, and during Mrs. Bush's lifetime, she was probably the second largest donor. Um, over 30 years, we invested about $130 million into the field, um, but we are essentially almost by ourselves. So we would ask that you give money, whether it's on the national level or the local level, um, but it's going to take more understanding um, of those adults who get here so they can, again, go back to Anne, empower our future generation and be able to support those children that are struggling. And also for Danny, um, those folks that are in prison today, it's because um, folks didn't help them um, get through. But when they get on the other side, Let's help them when they get out so that they don't go back to prison so we can lower those recidivism rates. So that would be our call and our plea and our ask. Thanks. 
And British, you bring something up, I think that's so important because where there's urgency, there's typically funding. And there has not been in our national dialogue, I think a sense of urgency around this. And it, it's, it's a conversation. I know the policy circle wants to make sure more people are having. Um, and I think you guys have unpacked even more layers of this because it, it, truth be known, we live in a world, right? Why does this matter to me? People ask that question. And I think you guys have identified some really important reasons. If anything, let's just look at the economic factors, if that's all you care about. But then let's look at these human factors. And Danny, I think you really highlighted a population that, you know, we really need to have a much better understanding of these marginalized communities. So what sort of your charge for the people today, Danny, that are participating on how they can get better involved? Yeah, well, I definitely want to echo what my colleagues have said, incredibly good advice. So I'm going to kind of follow up with the, everything great has been said. Let me add something slightly um, less insightful, but I think really important. When we talk about how important literacy is, it certainly is about building empathy and about being able to navigate. But a big thing that we're seeing in the literacy deficit to talk about how important it is, is that we're really lacking critical thinking as the, like a very present thing we do as a society. And I particularly see that because our demographic is young adults and younger people under the age of 35. So came up during some of these education initiatives where reading wasn't core to who they were. And so when we think of just very small things we can do that actually move the needle, just practice what you preach. Like read and engage with something before you get on social media and just randomly retweet something, read the article, think about it, encourage people to think about things before they go out. If you're a parent, read in front of your child as much as possible. Your children want to grow up to be like you. And even if they're rebelling against you, they still want to be like you. And also there's a sense of reading, particularly from even my generation, that is reading as elitism. It is, look how smart I am. I'm reading something so esoteric, you can't even pronounce it. What the best thing we can do is share that passion. Like read something that you love and then randomly talk to a stranger in the coffee shop about it. Yeah. That sort of passion is infectious. That's how books grow. That's why I loved reading as I was surrounded by enough nerds where I was like, ooh, nerd reading, this could be something rad try to do that as much as possible. So there are things you can do just in your tiny little community or your family or you and just your partner that will actually make the world a significantly better place. Oh, I love that. And I'll tell you, I saw a little you know, cartoon in the New York Times or something recently and a mother was on her phone at the park, looks over at a mother reading a book and says, how do you get your kid to read? <laughs> You know, mom's on the phone, awesome. mom's in a book, kid has a book. And so I think that you guys all bring up so many points because it could be our small little sphere of influence. And then there's that ripple effect, right? As we look at these different areas. So I love this advice. I want to go to a few questions in just the few minutes that we have left. I hope that's okay, ladies. And there's one here that I think is really interesting and we can decide who is going to answer this. Um, here's the question. Non-cognitive abilities have large impact on employment, labor force experience, college, participation, crime, so on and so forth. How can American public policy and our school interventions better promote non-cognitive abilities rather than principally focusing on cognitive test scores? There's another question in here about testing and the validity of testing too. So who wants to jump in and sort of tackle this interesting question? I always have to start in defense of testing. I'm like the you know, the fly on the punch bowl. I, I like, we are unabashed about our love of high quality assessments, not because they're the be all end all for education, but they're such an important measure of what's happening for kids, particularly when you disaggregate by race, socioeconomic status, uh, learning disability, um, gender, uh, English language learner status. It's really important for us to have a comparable high quality measure that lets us see kids apples to apples. So the reason why that matters is if we can't say as adults making decisions about resources, oh, those kids are never really gonna learn to read well, or those kids are never gonna quite do well. And that's, let us be okay with that, right? Like to let us sort of say about Danny, for example, you know what, she's really gonna struggle. We don't really need to worry about how she's doing. Now, so that being said, it's important for us to know where kids are academically so then educators can make smart decisions about all the soft skills that are important to us. I'm sure everybody on this um, screen has hired. We care a lot of, we know what makes people good. I see British in the hunting. When you think about who you all hire uh, mm -hmm. at the Barbara Bush Foundation and what kind of skill sets 
that they bring in, some of that is what we would, you might hear called soft skills that aren't necessarily gonna be measured by a standardized test. So it's never an either or, it's really simple to try to make it an either or, you have to think about what they each tell you and how important it is to really be clear. We wanna make sure kids are getting the academic preparation that they need to be able to be successful in their next step. But we're never saying that's the only thing they need, but it's a really critical core function. I'll stop there on my testing nope. box. No, no. And I think that's important too, because, you know, one of the other comments that we have here is, you know, sometimes you end up with a, an academic setting where they teach for the test, right? And you don't actually get a proper gauge on folks, you know, the, the students' abilities um, outside of sort of that testing environment. British, do you have a thought on this? The, the only thing that I would that I would add to, to what Anne was saying is that go back to the fundamentals, even to have those soft skills, reading matters. Reading is actually and literacy is the through line for those non-cognitive soft skills. So Danny raised this a few minutes ago. When you read, you're, it actually triggers different things in your brain without getting super technical. It makes you more empathetic. It makes you it opens your world in a different way so that you're those sort of softer skills are more evident um, and sort of come into play into your life. So again, you can't short shrift um, the ability to read, write, and comprehend, particularly reading. Um, even as adults, even though we may learn how to read, et cetera, et cetera, um, it, has, it gives us some of those skills exactly that you're asking, but you got that from reading. Mm -hmm. And evidence-based reading, phonics-based reading is where that came from. So it's inextricably linked. You can't separate it. That would be my comment. Yeah, cannot separate them. I think that's a really great answer to that. Danny, anything to add? No, I think that's exactly right. Like on my own journey, I kind of developed my soft skills faster than my hard skills. But that just mean I had to go back and learn my hard skills. <laughs> like it was like, okay, I have a passion for this. I have a workaround. But I still actually have to understand phonics in order to even read my X-Men comic. So like the ladies have said, they're just incredibly linked and you can't just connect them. And you have to and you have to test so you know where everybody is. So, I mean, I think that, that that's a really uh, important part of this is the testing and being able to, to have reliable data. And I think that's a big key that we're going to probably see over the next couple of years as our data sets catch up. We're going to get a much better sense of where we are. One other question, and then we're going to close on this. And this is interesting. This is one of our members that lives in Florida. She says that they have a large population of immigrants uh, in their schools and their community with, you know, that struggle or have limited um, proficiency in English. So what are some of the things that as adults, as, you know, fellow citizens that we can do to help that population um, really thrive and, and rise to the level they need to be successful in school with, with their literacy skills alongside their language skills? Who wants to jump, jump in with that? Anne, you got something on that? Well, I was looking at British because I'm like, I know she's got some ideas. British, we do, because oh, yeah. I can talk a little bit about schools, yeah. but I'm thinking about that's such a community issue and I, I want to know what you think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. First of all, um, immigrants are a core part of, of who we are as a people and a country and a nation. And we firmly believe that. Um, and those newly arriving immigrants, whether they be Haitian or they're from Latin America, um, this is the one area where we do a pretty decent job, actually, in the United States. We have many, many programs, what we call ESL programs, um, for newly arriving immigrants. Oftentimes it's tied to your asylum or your refugee status. Um, so a lot of that is available. In fact, native born um, folks uh, tend to struggle more. There are less services um, where there are a number of services. There's a national organization called TESOL um, and you can look this up and they have um, various community centers and sites um, in Florida. If you wanna volunteer and help, um, we would encourage you um, to go to their, their website, but we do a, a pretty decent job. Our kids, the immigrant children that arrive in school, um, you know, right away and can tell you this, um, you know, they're, they're, they go into English uh, learning programming. Um, so we're doing a better job there, believe it or not. When we talk about the 54 percent, it's two thirds, one third. We're actually talking about Native American born Native American uh, born folks who are low literate. It's not typically the immigrant population. So one myth I want to correct mm. is typically you're fluent in your own language when you come to the U.S. and you just have mm -hmm. to learn English. We always try to say sometimes there's that blame or misunderstanding that it's the immigrant population. That's actually not true. Um, so just want to clarify that as well. But there are many services, particularly in Florida, encourage you to go to the, the TESOL website. Again, this is where I'll say the, yeah. that this what? idea of systemic explicit instruction is so important in our schools because there are 
uh, just as British as was describing, if you are learning English and you're being taught in a balanced literacy whole language that is very loose around the rules and structure of our language, it is very difficult. It's difficult for native English speakers some, oftentimes to learn in that environment. It's very, very difficult for if you're learning English to learn without that kind of structured explicit uh, instruction. And that's where I think we we see over and over that the right kind of approach benefits everyone, mm -hmm. strong reader who will probably learn under most circumstances to anyone who has any issue. There's a whole litany of things that might um, that might be involved. And so that's why that that piece of it is so important to as we think about whether they're teaching children or adults is just a really critical anchor in that approach. Well, and I think, again, I appreciate too, British, what you're saying in terms of let's dispel some myths. Let's, you know, take some of these assumptions people have. Let's take it off the table. And that's such a big part of why the policy circle creates these briefs is so that you can read the brief, you can click on the sources. And at the end of it, you're really able to, to put you know, sort of some preconceived notions aside and deal with the facts. And so I think what you guys have shared with us today just layers even more insight onto that. Really appreciate these resources. Um, we are going to be sending out a follow-up email to everybody that's participated today with links to all the different resources that you've mentioned. And I also uh, just want to thank you all for your time. I think it is so valuable and I could talk to y'all all day. So thank you. And uh, we, we look forward to talking to you all again very soon. So thanks. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, that's all that we have time for today. I think this issue, as you can tell, is one that is complex, but there's also some real basics that we can can grasp and, and, and hold on to as citizens in terms of just getting more involved. And so the goal of Policy Circle Briefs and our Move the Needles is to make sure you're equipped to take action. So we have some slides that I think we're going to share um, that will tell you, here are some things that you can do. Obviously, we'd love for you to read this brief uh, and we'd like for you to share it share it with educators in your life, get their insight and input, um, you know, host a conversation in your home, at, at host a conversation in your library. Uh, there are people that are going to want to gather and talk about this. And I think this is a great opportunity to utilize the tools and resources at the policy circle to not only convene, but start to take la action at that local level. Uh, the literacy gap map, that that British mentioned, we think that's an incredible tool because you need to be informed about what, what's going on at you know the local level in your community. And again, I think you heard this from all of our speakers: volunteer, uh, get engaged. There's really no substitute for your personal engagement and involvement. So I'm going to wrap us up here with one quick reminder: uh, the Policy Circle's annual Leadership Summit is coming in October, and you are not going to want to miss this highly interactive and engaging event. And if you can't join us in person, which we still have a few seats left, um, you can engage with us virtually. We have an app. You can have access to this. There's no charge. Uh, we have 30 plus incredible speakers that include national experts and local practitioners. And we're talking about building thriving communities. This is something that I think everybody can find enriching. And I hope that you will sign up and register and participate with us when you can. And again, the Policy Circle thanks you for your time. If you find this programming to be of value, we would love to have your support. Um, join as a member with us, become part of our community, and uh, you know, all of us together can do so much to improve civil discourse and boost civic engagement in our community. So thank you again. We're grateful for you and hope you have an amazing rest of your day.